flew together, right? Yep. So amazing. Thank you guys for being here. Really appreciate it. Now, the big x -Plane keynote is happening tomorrow, so we'll see how much we can tease out of Philip before then. All yours. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome to IFR Navigation in X-Plane. Uh, this is uh, the captain's corner for FS Expo 2020, and now I just tacked on a plus one. Um, so here we are, one year later. Um, I'm, I will have a little bit of preview of the next generation of X-Plane in there, um, but I'm not allowed to reveal too much, so I encourage all of you to watch the X-Plane keynote tomorrow for the full picture. So for uh, my agenda, I'm going to talk about flight planning and briefing, um, how to get out of an airport. Most of, well, basically, I think all serious simulator pilots know how to fly a SID. Uh, I will talk a bit about the more obscure way to get out of mountainous airports, the ODP. Um, we're going to talk about levels of automation, how we use them during the ODP. Um, then, once we are in the en route airspace, we're going to talk about how this works here in the US, how it works over in Europe. Um, then, how to get into the airport with a star. And then, I will demystify or try to demystify the alphabet soup that we now have with the approaches because um, you open up the Jeppesen binder for any airport and it has approaches that say RNP and GLS and whatever, and, and you look at this, how am I supposed to use this? So I'm going to use uh, Xplane to show you how to use all of them. All right, I uh, worked very hard to get here. This is our flight route uh, this morning. We took off this morning at 7 o'clock, well, 6, uh, no, no, it's sort of same time zone. So 7 o'clock this morning in Sedona, and then we fought our way through this uh, uh, system of thunderstorms here and uh, flew our little diamond into Montgomery Field. So why am I qualified to talk about this? Um, I started working uh, on x as an add-on developer in uh, 2011. And in 2012, I was founding member of Flight Factor, though back then it wasn't called Flight Factor. When we started, it was called the Ramses Aviation Design Bureau. And um, Nicholas of uh, explain.org thought that sounded too communist. It sounded like something out of the Soviet Union, so we should change the name. And then uh, Roman here came up with uh, Flight Factor. Um, I've been with the Explain core team since uh, 2013. Uh, that's the same year I also got my uh, private pilot license. I hold uh, two licenses, both in uh, the US and over in Europe. Um, I became a flight instructor in 2016, and now the slide doesn't, didn't work. So I became a flight instructor in 2016, and since then I have uh, about 1,500 hours experience of flying close to 40 different types of aircraft. Uh, 500 of those are instruction, both uh, in Europe and in the US. I have a 100% pass rate of my instrument students. One of my instrument students sits right here, Roman of Flight Factor, like two years ago, I think. I taught him how to fly instruments. He passed his check right on the first go, like everyone else that I signed off. Um, I have a little bit experience on uh, the bigger airliners. I did my uh, ATP CTP on a 737-800. And um, I'm not type rated on any of those airliners. I just have a little bit of full flight simulator experience. So if you have really airline specific questions, um, we have a type rated 777 pilot right here. All right, so you want to make an IFR flight plan. And nowadays, there's uh, like two ways to do that. So the easiest way is you just file direct and let ATC figure it out. That's how most of the general aviation stuff works. We just open up for flight, say we want to go direct there and uh, hit send, and because normally there's no, not much IFR traffic at the altitudes we fly at, we often even get that direct, or if not, we just get a push notification that says, ah, go that way. Done, right? So 
um, I guess in this, um, the, the simulator word alternative to this is let, uh, let's simply figure it out. Punch your uh, approach, as, uh, sorry, your, your departure and your destination into Simbrief and let them figure it out. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about what is going on behind the scenes when ForeFlight does the job for you or SimFlight does the job for you. All right, so my approach to flight planning, both in, um, uh, for real flights and for simulated flights is to combine the sources that we have from the real world with the amazing resource that we have in the simulator world. So I use the websites for uh, tracking real life aircraft like FlightAware. I use a website called AutoRouter to uh, navigate the very complicated airspace in the EU. Um, I use ForeFlight to look at the end result, but ForeFlight is a subscription service that if you're a simulator pilot, you probably don't want to pay for. Um, so you would probably use uh, SkyVector, which is an amazing website uh, that basically, that, that offers you IFR and route charts for the entire world, just for free. Just go to SkyVector, look at the uh, area you're interested in, click IFR low, and you get a high quality IFR and route chart. And it's just no subscription necessary. Amazing. Um, then we just, so we use those real world quote unquote tools for preparation. And when we have a route that uh, pass muster for the real world, then we switch over into the simulator world. Then we go to SimBrief. Then we brief it with a performance profile of the airplane that we're actually flying. Um, and SimBrief is an amazing website that has uh, come a long way since its in uh, inception. And I nowadays see it as the spiritual successor to FOC. Flight Operation Center. Who remembers that program? Who remembers FOC? No one. I, I'm that old, apparently. So Flight Operation Center came out in 2003, and I think its slogan was, uh, um, use a real tool, quit using toys for flight planning. And back in 2003, that was, uh, it was written by a um, dispatcher who worked for Swiss Air. And it was an absolutely amazing uh, uh, flight planning tool. And I think SimBrief today comes close to the, the sophistication that they had back then in 2003. All right, so very simple. We want to go from Dallas to Houston. So how do we do that? Um, for flights that are flown every day, or in that case, probably multiple flights every day, we just use a standard route. So we go to the FAA website where they keep the PREF routes, the preferred routes. So it's a beautifully long government uh, URL that you don't have to remember if you just type in FAA preferred routes into Google, you get that, and then you punch in your uh, departure and destination into that website, and then you get a route. And you will notice, let's see, does this have a laser pointer? Yeah, there we go. Um, so it tells you the, the route to go from DFW to uh, Houston, and the route depends on whether Houston uses the west flow or the east flow, depending on uh, whether they are landing uh, west or east, depending on wind. And sure enough, so if you look at the route string, they use the darts 8 uh, sit and the uh, driller 5 star for the west flow. And sure enough, um, if you look on FlightAware for that day where they are using the West Flow and you look at the route that they filed on FlightAware, it's precisely that. So no magic, just preferred route database. So um, FlightAware is, I think, the source for routes that uh, originate or terminate in the, uh, in the US because everything that is filed through um, a system that interacts with the US ATC um, is visible there, including the eastbound flights over the Atlantic. So if you find an e eastbound flight over the Atlantic, even though the rest of the route deals uh, in Europe or is in Europe, uh, flight aware will not, nonetheless know the, 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 the complete route. And those are real ATC, ATC cleared routes that actually work in the real world, so why not use them for the simulator? So here, for example, um, see it's not even, it's not limited to, to, to US, so this is a flight from, um, uh, Charlotte up to uh, Toronto, and uh, um, well, the, uh, no, the other way around goes goes down to Charlotte. Point is, this flight originates in Canada, but you still get get the full route. Or here, you have a 
uh, route from, from DFW over to Frankfurt in Germany, crosses the North Atlantic, even though it goes into Europe airspace, FlightAware is the full route, uh, we could use that. So there's this is a complicated looking string over here uh, that we're trying to decode. How does this work? Um, it starts with a SID and a transition. And uh, the thing to note about the US SID is, is that they no are normally not runway dependent. So um, no matter what runway they are using, uh, ZAC-3 uh, SID just gets a different um, uh, runway transition prepended to it, and then it works for all runways. Then those uh, three letter identifiers behind it, those are just uh, VORs. And uh, that's uh, what, what is called a random route or a free route uh, because it doesn't use any airways. It's just VOR to VOR. And um, then they actually use a bit of airway, though this is kind of unnecessary because there are no points between those two. It just happens to be an airway segment. And then it gets interesting. This is a North Atlantic track. So NAT W is the whiskey North Atlantic track. And then again, we have to uh, utilize Google to find all the points for that. So if you uh, look up the NOTEMS for the North Atlantic tracks, uh, again, beautifully long government URL to find that, you will find an information that looks like this. The whiskey track starts at a point, and then it has coordinate pairs where you have to use your imagination that if they are over the North Atlantic, they are probably going to be north and west coordinates. That's how you need to enter them. Um, and then, interestingly enough, it says the east levels to use are 320, 340, 360, 380, and 400. I'm not quite sure why, why on this day they go against the, um, uh, the, the, the semicircular rules that going east, you use an, you use an uh, even flight level. I'm not quite sure why, why that was the fact on, on that day. I was looking it up. And then, after you exit the, the North Atlantic track uh, routes, you enter the European part of it, and that works pretty much exactly like, uh, like, like the US part. You have points, airways between points, and um, you end up at a point called Ramop. That's get, that gets interesting in a bit. Uh, so you use, they use both free routing and airways. And if you try to put this into the FMC like that, you will notice that um, if you just paste it in like this, you get spaghetti because uh, the star does not actually start here. The, the star is a longer route, and Ramop is just one point on the star. So if you enter it into the FMC like that, and you get spaghetti, that's not a bug. That's just how this route is made. You, need to, um, you just need to delete all the points in the star that, that are before that point. All right, in Europe, things get a little bit more complicated because making a CFMU valid route is a bit of an art form. So this is an actual error message that you get when you try to, um, when you just try to make a route and you get this uh, very easy to understand error message and then you are supposed to deal with that. Um, and the restrictions they put on airways seemingly depend on the moon phase. So I can never figure this out. Um, so the way to deal with this as a simulator pilot is make an autorouter account, which is a real world flight planning website in Europe. Um, and if you never complete the registration to actually file flight plans, um, then you can just, just uh, use that for your simulator purposes. Um, and if you just use any business jet profile, um, of course, it's not going to work if you use a 172 profile and want to make a, want to make a route that goes over flight level uh, 320. Um, so just use a business jet profile, uh, put your departure and destination in, and I'm using an Embraer Phenom profile here. Um, doesn't matter because the actual performance planning will be done later. And then you let this thing crank, and 11 minutes and 21 seconds later, it has found a route that passes all those Byzantine validation rules, and we actually have a route now that we, that we can use. Um, so the European route string, uh, here looks a bit confusing if you are used to the American format. Uh, it starts with an N and F group. What that means is the airspeed and the flight level that you're going to file. So November 0388 means 388 knots through airspeed, and F350 just means uh, flight level 350. And you can e actually use this also to plan step climbs. So if you have the 
flight plan, and it, is, and it says in the flight plan, slash n some numbers, f some numbers, that means for you, aha, they planned a step climb here. So you can't enter it like this into the FMC. You just need to remember what this slash n and f means. Um, in, Euro in Europe, this, uh, the SIDs are usually runway specific. We'll get to uh, see this a, a bit later. Um, then they spell out direct if they say DCT and you try to put, put that into the FMC, you're going to get an error because there's no DCT VOR anywhere. Uh, DCT just means there's no airway, go, go direct. Uh, though there are, there are limits, I think in, in Europe you can only file 40 miles or so uh, direct. Um, and then you have an, um, an RNF star in this, prof, uh, in this uh, example, and usually this will be followed by an RNF transition that is runway specific. We'll look at an example later. Oh, so now we have found this after 12 minutes of crunching in, in, in the auto router, and now we go back to SimBrief and put this in, but SimBrief again uses the flight aware format, so the American format. So what we have to do is we have to remove all those DCTs because SimBrief has absolutely no idea what DCT is, and uh, then you end up with a route string that looks exactly like, um, uh, like flight aware, and then you can use SimBrief to, to your liking from here on. So what I'm trying to say here is, and this is why I put this one up here in green and the, the X down here, um, I never use the route finder that comes with SimBrief because it is, um, it is perfectly usable in the US, but it does not know how to deal with those weird CFMU rules in Europe. And there was a way where you could just click this button here to, to send it through the European validation, but Eurocontrol apparently told them, uh, you're a simulator website, you are not serious, I shut you off, and this button doesn't work anymore. So uh, auto router is the way to go. And, um, but now that we have reached this point, after using all those other websites and all those other sources, we have the full power of SimBrief at our disposal and can start making, uh, uh, can start making an actual briefing. Um, now this is something, this is a little bit more specific. Um, when do you need to file an alternate? So in the US we have the one, two, three rule. The one, two, three rule is if within one hour before and one hour after the arrival at your destination, the weather is predicted to be uh, uh, 2,003 miles visibility, then you don't even need to file an alternate airport. Um, but I guess most airlines just have it in the op spec that you need to file an alternate any, uh, anyway. Uh, does anyone know what a takeoff alternate is? Takeoff alternate airport. Well, you don't count. <laughs> where you left from. Yeah, where you left from. So takeoff alternate is for the case that the, the airport where you're taking off from is low IFR and you can get out and then an engine fails but you cannot get back in. So you are trapped above a cloud um, with an engine failure or some other kind of uh, abnormality, and um, then you fly to an alternate, but the alternate is not close to where you're going. The alternate is, way, is close to where you took off from because you need an alternate to go to because the failure happened um, while you were taking off into the clouds that you cannot go back down through. Um, and under part 91, so how general aviation flies, um, we don't have those rules. Um, and I just teach my students, um, if you can't get back into the airport you're taking out of, it is probably not a good idea to take off from there in the first place. So this is how I teach this to my students. Um, I'm going to skip over the equipment codes because this is uh, extremely airplane specific and um, does not, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how serious Iveo and uh, VATSIM and Pilot Edge take those equipment codes going to skip over this. Um, let's talk about flying the SID. So in Europe, most SIDs are very deterministic because they are precisely designed for noise abatement. Some US SIDs do that too, but uh, in the US, another format is much more popular. Um, they use just RNF GPS waypoints now, though often they employ um, GPS waypoints to mimic 
something that they constructed years ago using VOR and DME. So sometimes I get a question, hey, why is this SID not in X-Plane? I cannot load the, the such and such SID in X-Plane that uses the VOR radial and the DME distance such and such, or maybe an NDB even. Um, and I say, well, there's exactly the same SID as an overlay. You need to use the overlay that gives you the exact same route, the exact same ground track, um, but instead of having the, the, v, uh, the, the radial and the DME waypoints there, it's just going to be a, a GPS waypoint. So um, that's what that looks like. So when it says RNF departure overlay, um, the chart, uh, the, the 3L1 chart will have the exact same routing, but this will be a radial, this will be a DME, this will also be a DME. And if you try to find that in the FMC, it won't actually say that. In the FMC, it, it'll say DF149, DF155, DF169, uh, and so on. That's, that's not a bug, that's just that um, the overlay uses the, the, the GPS waypoints and not the DME radials. But you can see here, it's a very simple deterministic route. You load this into the FMC, you get exactly that route. You end up at this point. At this point, you connect to your airway. Everyone walks home happy. Simple. Um, some uh, SIDs in the US work like that too. Um, this is the uh, departure that we were using earlier at DFW. You punch that in, you go home happy. Then something else happens. Vector SIDs, and I get this a lot. There's a lot of forum questions. People uh, hit the support, and they say, I put this SID in, and I put the autopilot on, and it just flew two hours in that direction and never went anywhere. So I, I actually get this question a lot. So when people um, discuss on the forums, how do I use the FMC? Oh, when I put this in, it says vectors, and then it doesn't do anything. What do I do? What do I do? Um, so this is actually pretty common uh, uh, in the US. The ATC had a lot more freedom to vector aircraft, so they use a lot uh, less of those prescribed uh, route SIDs and just say, hey, ATC vectors you where you need to be. Um, so the, uh, uh, the SID will have one vector segment. Or another support question that we get, I load um, Chicago O'Hare and it has approaches but has no SIDs. Where are the SIDs of Chicago O'Hare? So in, in Chicago or here, they did away with the, with the route SIDs altogether. They just say, hey, it's, it's all vectors. So this is what a chart for such a SID looks like. Any track, any waypoint. So at some point, you're going to join one of those tracks that goes out here. But how do you get from the runway to somewhere here or somewhere down there or somewhere there? It's completely up to ATC. So when you take off into that, your FMC will say, will, will usually have a 400 foot altitude waypoint, and then it'll just say vectors. And if you leave it on autopilot, it just goes. And then you write an email to explain support and says it doesn't go anywhere. So the FMC is not much help either because it just says vector or mansec. Mansec is a manual sequence, it's the same thing. And the departure description just say climb on assigned heading and um, expect vectors. So what do we do here as a simulator pilot? Mm, there's no real answer. So one possible answer is, of course, to fly online, use Pilot Edge, use VATSIM, use IVEO. Um, then you will be talking to real people that actually give you a heading segment. Uh, and then at some point, the person will say, fly direct this and that waypoint. And then it's time to pull up the FMC and press direct intercept and hit the waypoint. And from then on, everything's normal again. Um, so you can watch on FlightAware where planes get turned and uh, vector yourself, or um, nicely hidden secret on some um, SID charts is the lost comms procedure. So for, for example, here getting out of Oakland, um, this SID has a dotted line here. And the dotted line, if you look in the description, is the lost comms procedure. So in case you take off and your radio fails or the controller is gone to sleep or whatever, um, you are supposed to uh, climb out on the prescribed track to 3,000, then fly heading 200, and then join this VOR radial. This segment, this dotted segment here is not coded. So typical support question. I see this on the chart, and I load it in the FMC, and it's not there. Instead, it's a vector's leg. So yeah, 
the, the, the coded SID does not code this lost com segment. That's why it's dotted. That's why it's not a solid line. So you actually have to open the chart, read the chart, read the lost comms procedure. So this is a perfectly valid way to deal with this. If you're not flying online, if you're not talking to a pilot edge controller, um, look for the lost comms procedure, pretend your radio has failed and you are not in contact with the controller and fly the, fly the lost comms procedure. All right. Everyone can do SIDs now, including vector SIDs. Now, what do we do if we take off, off, out, of a, uh, if we take off out of an airport that is so small that it doesn't even have a SID? So one of the FAA's best kept secrets in the chart supplement are the obstacle departure procedures only, uh, the obstacle departure procedures. They are textual description of how to get out of the airport safely. There's no chart, there's no plate, there's no track. Um, you just have to read it and you have to find it. So, and it's not in any FMS database. There's no way to pull those up in, in the FMS. And it's not exactly obvious what they're doing from the filed route string. So here's an airline flight out of Durango, Colorado to Phoenix, Arizona. And Durango, Colorado is in mountainous terrain. So you really want to know what you're doing when you take off there. And the route string they filed says something like, um, Durango, uh, VOR, and Reaser. And if you put that into the FMC, like you're sitting on the runway, go to the Durango VOR, which is off the airport there, and then this way, you get a magenta spaghetti on the ND. Doesn't work. You will not be able to, to take off uh, in LNAV mode and expect the FMC and the autopilot to fly this spaghetti. Doesn't work. So how do we do this? How do we, how do we prevent the spaghetti? So we go to a, 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 any website that gives us access to the free FAA charts. So this is all, you don't need a subscription or anything. This is all publicly available information. And you go to the Durango, Colorado airport and you look for the instrument procedures. And under the approach procedures, it says special takeoff minimums and departure procedures only. I mean, it's under approach. It's absolutely obvious that they want you to find that, that that's for the departure. Um, then you get a giant PDF with like all the airports in Colorado and Arizona and whatever, and then you control F and look up Durango. I'm not making this up. That's how you do it. Um, and then you find a textual description how to get out of this airport. So the, um, the uh, departure procedure says climbing right turn to 9000, then turn heading 180, then intercept the Durango uh, VOR radial 125 to Reaser intersection. And then from that intersection is where your flight plan starts. And that information is no, not charted on any graphical chart anywhere. You have to read it. Okay, Jeppesen makes it a little bit easier. Jeppesen doesn't make you control F and find the city in a giant list of all the cities in Colorado. Um, if you have Jeppesen plates like through uh, Navigraph, um, and you pull up the airport plate, there's not going to be a SID plate, the airport plate, the, de the departure procedure is down here. All right, and how do we actually do this when we sit on the runway? We can't make the FMC do this. So what I suggest doing here is something that will make every simulator pilot shiver, and that is you leave the route discontinuity there. So because no amount of button pushing on the FMC will produce you the correct magenta line, so you could put in the first leg as uh, Durango to Reaser, but then you might be tempted to just intercept this magenta line. So what I suggest is that you should leave a discontinuity there because that prevents you from arming LNAV before you take off, and there's absolutely no distraction on the map display. What you have to do is you have to identify the VOR, you have to present the radial, you need to switch over your, your uh, MD to the VOR mode where it shows you the VOR radial. So you're in rose mode, not in map mode. You have to listen to the, um, either listen to the audio frequency or make sure it has decoded the, um, the VOR ID there. And um, you climb out, you climb straight ahead to 400 AGL, and then you fly raw data with the VOR needle. And once you are on the radial that you pulled out of this textual description, that's when it's a good time to pull up the FMC, press direct intercept, go to the intersection, but only if you're done with your textual description. So I know no one wants to take off like this, like from Durango into boxes, discontinuity. 
If you press LNF arm, it says, boop, can't do it. Um, but this is the correct, way, uh, the correct way to take off from there. All right, as I said, we are flying to, we are flying to 400 feet, and then we use raw data. Um, this is a card I got during my uh, ATP CTP training, even though I did it on the 737. This is an Airbus card. Um, the golden rules for all pilots. Fly, navigate, and communicate in this order. Use the appropriate level of automation at all times. That's an important one. And understand the FMA at all times. Um, point three is something that I see both with sim pilots and with my real students that they um, press a button on the autopilot and then expect something to happen and don't cross-check with the FMA if that's actually the thing that's happening. So levels of automation, what does that mean? There's level zero, manual flying, you have your hands on the yoke and the throttle. Then you have the simple modes of the autopilot, heading and flight level change, heading and altitude, attitude hold. Um, attitude hold, does anyone actually use that? Do you? sometimes actually just use attitude hold for something. The, the correct way to use attitude hold is when you're experiencing moderate, or, or, uh, moderate turbulence, because you don't want the autopilot to fight the turbulence and try to hold the altitude. When you encounter severely rough air, go into attitude hold, control wheel steering, uh, fly the pitch, fly the pitch and power, let the and don't let the autopilot fight the, the variations in altitude. So in, in the real world, you would ask ATC for a, for a block altitude. You ask for block 340 to 360, for example, um, because you won't be able to hold the altitude if the turbulence is really that severe. And of course, the highest level of automation that we, achieve, that we try to achieve most of the time is flying with LNAV and VNAV. And just as my example of Colorado just, just showed you, there are situations where NF and VNF just doesn't get you there. So especially in a, in, a, in a changing environment. When ATC asks you to make a change, point the aircraft in the right direction with heading and level change, um, then make your edit, verify what the active flag is, verify what is actually the, 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 the magenta uh, point and then hit, hit exec. And then, when that is displayed on the ND, then you can press LNAV, not before. So the highest level of automation perils, I have this wonderful quote here. Um, the mystery of the VNAV button was a common source for consternation. Um, it never seemed that the function of VNAV was consistently in harmony with the autothrottles, the FMS, or the autopilot. The program crossing altitude would be reached too late, the descent airspeed would exceed the entered value, or the author throttles would revive from hibernation and re-energize with more power. So was this someone reviewing an X-plane aircraft? Nope. That is out of Flying Magazine, July 2015. This is an actual pilot recounting his experience with a real uh, 757. So just to drive that point home, if it doesn't do what you want it to do, heading and level change. We'll get you there, figure it out, reprogram it, and then re-engage it. All right, so we've successfully taken off. We have successfully transrouted, uh, um, gone into the en route airspace. In the US, we have the Victor and Juliet routes that go between VORs, the, the, the Quebec and Tango routes that use GPS, various other letters in other countries. So you think you have understood everything, and then you hit Eastern Europe. This is not an ocean. That is Czechos uh, Austria and Czechoslovakia. The airways end there. And this is also a bug report that we get now and then. I try to load this airway, and it just ends in Austria. What's up with that? So in Europe, they have started an experiment uh, called free routing airspace. They are doing away with the uh, airway structure. They only keep points. Um, they don't uh, designate airways between those points any more, uh, anymore. The goal is to reduce route overhead. It still doesn't make filing easier because you cannot simply go from any point to one another. There's still this hoop that you have to jump through with the CFMU validation to get a valid sequence of points. Um, but the goal is that Europe wants to do, uh, wants to have free routing airspace in uh, 2022. And uh, I'm looking forward to the bug reports that I'll be getting when the X-Plane map stops displaying airways in Europe. 
Um, interestingly, even the North Atlantic tracks are going this way. Uh, this year, on uh, March 9th, was the first day where absolutely no North Atlantic tracks were published. So North Atlantic is also going free route airspace. So eventually, they will also be filing point, each airplane will be flying individual points. All right, we've transitioned whatever the North Atlantic or the European free routing airspace, and um, now we want to arrive at the airport. We want to fly a star into the airport. Um, you, um, some are designed to nicely stitch together to the approach transition. Um, Europe uses approach transitions extensively that um, tie nicely into the star or replace the star completely. You punch that into the FMC, you get a wonderful a continuous route. Everyone walks home happy. Then you look at it and you notice this weird curves that make a long detour. Um, but the good thing is if you've punched it into the FMC, there's no discontinuities or vectors. Um, those trombones are usually cut short by ATC, um, but if you're flying offline, you can again apply loss comp procedures, and the loss comp procedure is usually fly the whole thing. So this is what this looks like arriving into Vienna. Um, we have a wonderful RNF star that begins at a point uh, in the en route segment. It ends at another GPS point, and if we load up any approach to any runway, it connects there, no discontinuity, and then it makes this makes this long snake here, and uh, you finally end up there. And if you're flying online, you probably won't be flying the full snake, the full trombone. They just give you a direct to a point and you cut short. Uh, in the US, again, they um, allow more freedom. They don't code any trombones. They, they don't code this, um, this uh, segment, this, this downwind segment. Instead, they use a, a vector there. And the points between the approaches and the stars often don't link up at all. So this is, again, something that I uh, observe in the forums very often. People say, I have this flight plan. I put it into the FMC, but I always get a discontinuity. And um, that's, uh, sometimes that's just fact of life. So uh, going into Houston here, the Houston uh, flow for landing uh, towards west. Uh, the star ends uh, here in a segment that just goes on and on forever. If you put that into the FMC, it just flies that way until it runs out of fuel. And the approach that you want to fly has absolutely no point that connects to any star. So you end up with something that looks like this. You overfly Zoe, and then you get fly heading 078 or as assigned, and then comes the next instruction, and now uh, for everyone here and online, you can begin to speculate what next airplane in X-plane this FMC is from. Hint, hint. All right, we have managed to arrive at the airport and we have managed to load up an approach. I'm not going to talk about the uh, ground-based approaches, ILS, localizer, VOR, NDB, because the capabilities of your airplane are very obvious, whether it has an ILS receiver or not. I mean, all airplanes nowadays probably have an ILS receiver, but it's, it's immediately obvious what you can do. With all the new alphabet soup, RNF, RNP, GPS, GLS, WAS, um, that causes a lot more confusion. So, um, in fact, RNF doesn't even need to mean GPS. This is an RNF approach from 1981. Um, they just have points with coordinates, and you either use a Loran navigator, or um, instead of using the coordinates, it also mentions the VOR, radial, and distance, and you use this free flight system course line computer from the 80s, where you enter the, the radial and the, um, the distance, and what it does, it makes you a virtual VOR that you just fly the VOR needle. So amazing stuff. They actually made approaches with that back then. But 40 years later, um, required navigation performance in theory allows using other stuff that is not GPS. But in practice, all of these approaches, if you look in the database, they have the flag set for GNSS required. So without GPS, you're not doing them. Um, so that means if you fly the classic flight factor 757, where the FMS has no GPS, everything is DME, DME, and IRU, the RNF approaches show up in the FMC because they are in the database. But you are actually not 
able to fly them. So this is also something that shows up in the forum every now and then. Um, if I fly the 757 without the GPS, I load the RNF approach, I fly it down, I come out of the clouds and the runway is there instead of in front of me. And with that airplane, that's a feature, that's not a bug because this is only does RNAV1, it doesn't have the approach capability, and um, uh, in real life you would not be allowed to load this approach in the FMC. All right, so the GPS-based approaches in a plane that actually has GPS where you can actually use it, so not Flight Factor 757 with the old FMS, uh, they fall basically into three categories. The GLS approach, which is very popular over in Europe, especially uh, over in Russia, um, not popular here in the US. Uh, the RNP approach with the uh, FAA still calls RNF GPS, and the RNP AR approach. So I'm going to show you all three, um, how, to put them, how to put them in and fly them. So GLS. Um, if you find old approach charts and they, call, they talk about local area augmentation system, LAS, or ground-based augmentation system, GBAS, it's all the same thing. So the GLS approach requires special equipment both on the ground and in the aircraft. It requires a, 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 um, a, a GPS augmentation station that is in the vicinity of the airport. So there's going to be equipment installed at the airport. Um, many airliners have a multi-mode receiver to pick this up. Uh, in uh, the next generation of X-Plane, we have, made, we have uh, made this more accessible to third-party developers, so it's easier for them to integrate into their aircraft too. Um, some biz jets have that, but basically no GA aircraft whatsoever has this. As I said, it's not very popular in the US. It is as precise as an ILS Cat 1 or, or, or better, and it looks like and is flown like an ILS. It gives you a glide slope and a, a localizer and a glide slope that looks just like an ILS. Um, this is what the chart for such a GLS approach looks like. Um, it mentions up here a channel that you need to tune, and that channel is the channel of the little ground station at the airport. So, but normally you don't need to tune this because if you pull the approach up out of the, uh, out of the database, the FMS can pre-tune that for you. On other airplanes, like the 737, you need to dial in this frequency by hand into, into the multi-mode receiver. Again, uh, next generation of X-Plane makes this a little bit easier. So if you have it here on the radios, it has this five-digit number for the, uh, for, the, um, for the approach. It has something that's called AZ, azimuth, uh, 268, that's, the, that's basically the localizer course, and it has a glide path angle of three degrees. And um, now with this secret aircraft that is going to be revealed tomorrow as part of next generation of X-Plane, uh, when you fly this, this is what it looks like. So you get an indication here that looks exactly as if you were flying an ILS. You get an, a four-letter identifier that starts with G, for GLS instead of I for ILS, uh, but otherwise exactly the same. It has a four-letter identifier, it has a localizer, it has a glide path. You fly it in, um, you, can, you can actually fly it in approach mode. Um, not sure why I'm still in LNAV at this point. I could be in approach mode at this point already. All right, so as I said, very few airports have this. The most common that you are encounter, that you're going to encounter at most airports is the um, RNF GPS approach, what we over in Europe call RNP, but operationally it's the same. You need an IFR certified GPS to give you LNAV, and then you have uh, various ways to get VNAV to it. Um, for example, what is most often used in general aviation is a receiver that can, that can uh, pick up satellite-based augmentation system, WAS in the US and EGNOS over in Europe. Um, the cool thing about the satellite-based augmentation is that there's no equipment at the airport. The airport doesn't need to invest into a thing that they install there. Um, the GPS in the uh, airliner needs to be, uh, in the airplane needs to be WAS capable. And surprisingly, almost no airliner has this. Very few, very new airliners um, have a WAS receiver or, or, or an SBAS receiver, but if you walk into the average Southwest or American Airlines cockpit and ask the captain what are the minimums you can down, go down to on the RNF GPS approach, well, he says LNAV, B 
because he doesn't have a um, because he doesn't have a, a was receiver in his A320 or Boeing 737. So some 30, uh, 737s are retrofit to have this, um, but um, very, very, very few airliners actually have this. So how does it work uh, in the airliners? The airliners instead use Barrow VNAV. So they generate the descent path from uh, the barometric altitude, and that comes with a few restrictions because that depends on your altimeter setting. You need to be very sure that you got the correct altimeter setting because if you load an, load an approach that uses Barrow VNAV and your altimeter setting is set wrong, you are flying down the glide slope needle, so the glide path needle perfectly, but if the altimeter setting is off, you're going to crash in front of the runway or overshoot the runway. It only works if you have the correct altimeter setting. And there's another caveat to it. Some of them have cold weather restrictions. And I'm going to show you tomorrow in the X-Plane keynote why some approaches have cold weather restrictions. That's all I'm going to say about that today. But more on that tomorrow in the, tomorrow in the keynote. Um, and comes with, um, some with those restrictions, but the good thing is no special training or authorization is required. You can load this in X-Plane in your 172. So if you want to arrive in Houston International with your 172, you can in X-Plane. You, you, you load the RNF GPS approach. Um, you fly it and actually in X-Plane in the 172, you are allowed to use the lowest line of minimums here, LPV, because uh, the 172 in X-Plane is WAS equipped, unlike most A320s and 737s that fly there. All right, that's what it looks like on the, on the GPS. Actually, this one also has a channel, this five-digit number, but that refers to, um, uh, to WAS. There's no receiver in the cockpit. There's absolutely no place in the cockpit where you need to enter this five-digit number. This five-digit number appears here in the GPS just as an artifact from the database, um, but there's no radio where you need to tune this. And then once you get the LPV indication down here, you know it's actually working. In X-Plane, even in X-Plane 11, you can fail the satellite-based augmentation system, so you can simulate a satellite outage or an equipment failure, and then this will not show. This will only give you LNAV, so this is a failure that even works in, in X-Plane 11. So finally, the category of approaches that scares most people away because they uh, it's surrounded by a bit of mystery, and that's RNPAR, Required Navigation Performance Authorization Required comes down to a precision of 0.1 or 0.3, and that makes you think, that's awfully wide. Like 0.1 mile? That's actually not very precise. My, my, my LPV approach is much, much more precise than that. So why do they make this big fuss about authorization required about those approaches that actually do not require that much precision? Um, I think all of them are GPS required in practice, so I don't think there are any RNPAR approaches that you could fly with, for example, the 757 with the old FMS that doesn't have GPS. Um, if someone knows of an RNPAR approach that doesn't, that you can fly with DME, DME, I would like to hear about it, tell me about it, always eager to learn. Um, so what they use that for is, for example, for parallel dependent and or converging approaches. Because if you figure the LPV approach, the localizer performance approach, it works like an ILS. The further away you get from the runway, the wider the beam or the virtual beam that the GPS gets, uh, generates gets. And um, if you have parallel approaches to runways at the same airport in bad weather, you can't have people fly on a wide localizer beam. So they use the RNPAR approach to keep the um, the, the point 0.1 or point 0.3 um, uh, tunnel, basically, um, further away from the runway. And they use RNPAR whenever they need to have a radius to fix leg, whenever they have a curved segment in there. Uh, RNP means onboard monitoring is required, and special authorization is required for both aircraft and crew, um, which means 
If you are uh, loading this in the 172 in the G1000 and it shows up as an RNP and AR approach, it is in the database, but you're not actually allowed to, to fly it. And occasionally I get bug reports from people trying certain RNP AR approaches somewhere in the 172 and they say it doesn't work. And I say, yeah, it shouldn't work. It's also illegal. So, and they all use Barrow VNAV. None of them use uh, SBAS for, for getting you down. So it is susceptible to altimeter setting and temperature error, hint, hint, for tomorrow. Um, so this is what it looks like when you, uh, when you load it. And this is what it looks like. And I think I'm running out of time now. Um, fortunately, this is actually the last slide. So this is what it looks like when you have, uh, uh, when you have loaded it. It gives you a GPS, um, GPS LNF path. And the way you would fly this in the 737 is you would not switch to approach mode for in most situations, you would fly this in LNF and VNAV, except if you equip the airplane with integrated approach navigation, which is now an option in the next generation of X-Plane, um, when you can, where you can override the ILS signal with this approach, and then you can actually fly this um, in approach mode. All right, I'm very much out of time, I think. I so, yeah. <laughs> so if, um, so if you have any more questions uh, regarding the operation of these systems in, in X-Plane. Yeah, just no outside, humans. if you wanted to, Philip, just maybe step outside either those doors or those doors, you can absolutely take some questions. Thank you very much for All a great right. presentation. And, and see the keynote tomorrow. And so, and as he says, of course, X-Plane will be back on tomorrow at 2 p.m. with their keynote announcing a little bit more about the next generation of the simulator. So we'll take about a 10-minute break and then wrap up the day today talking about the thing that was supposed to start the day today, that is PC building, hardware tuning, and everything else that you want to know about building your own computer.